Most of the first Dutch colonists were not in fact Dutch, but French-speaking Belgian Huguenots. 110 men, women, and children in all, in 30 different families. Cast-offs, hoping to make a go of it in the new world. They quickly settled on the slender island at the head of the bay, which they called Manhattan, after an old Indian word, thought by some to mean island of hills, and by others, place of general inebriation. At the southernmost tip, they cleared land and built simple bark cabins, a crude counting house, and a stone and earth fort. Then widened the old Indian trail that ran north from the makeshift village and named it Heerstraat, or Breedaway. It would become Broadway. Other settlements soon sprang up around the harbor, including the village of Breukelen, named for a town back in Holland, and up along the East River, a sprawling plantation owned by a Danish farmer named Jonas Bronk. It was soon known simply as the Bronx. In 1626, just two years after the colony was founded, a ship carrying the first 11 African slaves arrived from Angola. They were quickly put to work building the fort and clearing land for white farmers. That same year, the director general, Peter Minuit, called together the leaders of all the local tribes and made them a fateful offer. They have bought the island Manhattis from the wild men, the company accountant later reported for the value of 60 guilders. The Dutch had, in fact, paid much more than the $24 of legend, but still less than $600 for all 14,000 acres of Manhattan real estate. The Indians, who had lived on the island since the end of the Ice Age, thought the arrangement temporary. What's at the beginning of the city is at the end of the city, it's a real estate deal. And if there's ever a kind of motif that runs through the history of the city, it's that. It's the real estate deal at the beginning of the very existence of the city. New York was founded for no other reason than to make a buck. The Puritans came to New England to, in order to worship God as they saw fit. The Catholics came to Maryland, the Quakers to Pennsylvania. The Dutch came to Manhattan to get beaver skins. And so devoted were they to making a profit that they didn't get around to even building a church for 17 years. And ever since, however big the city has gotten, somewhere deep in its soul, it is always New Amsterdam, where modern capitalism was invented. But there were problems from the start. Though thick bales of beaver, otter, muskrat, and mink were soon being shipped back to Holland four times a year, the remote and lonely colony, 4,000 miles from the mother country, struggled to take hold. People in Holland are, in fact, not terribly interested in coming here. The promoters send back these tracts about the glories of this place. But, you know, the fact of the matter was that from a Dutch perspective, if you were in Amsterdam um, uh, and you wanted to make your fortune out in the colonies, you went to the Spice Islands, you went to Brazil, you got into the African slave trade. Beavers was a distinctly second-rate uh, uh, operation. It was for second-rank uh, uh, merchants. In the winter of 1643, the colony's troubles deepened when an incompetent director named Willem Kieft tried to tax the local Indians, then launched a brutal year-long war against them when they resisted. In February, a platoon of Dutch soldiers fell on two unsuspecting Lenape villages along the East River, butchered 80 men, women, and children in their sleep, then marched back to Fort Amsterdam with their heads on pikes. Before the year was out, hundreds of Native Americans and dozens of Dutch settlers had died in what was called the Year of the Blood. Less than two decades after being founded, the fledgling colony had begun to fall apart, its population dwindling, drunkenness on the rise, and morale at an all-time low. The most interesting thing about the Dutch period in New York to me is how much it set the pattern for behavior in New York. I forget what the exact ratio is, but there was an absurd ratio of citizens to taverns. 
it was virtually that every 20 guys had their own tavern. And it remains a ratio that's probably pretty close to the way the city has, has remained throughout its history. It's like Dodge City. I mean, every other building is a bar, it's a mud hole, a sinkhole, the fort is falling down, pigs are rooting in the, uh, uh, in the foundations. We need to shape this place up. And what they do is they, like a global corporation that they were, you can sort of think of the West India Company as sort of like Exxon with guns, I mean, with its own naval fleet. They transferred a branch manager from Curaçao uh, up to New York and said, we want you to whip this place into shape. And he did. In the spring of 1647, New Amsterdam got a new director general, a 37-year-old ex-soldier and minister's son who had lost his right leg to a cannonball during a naval battle in the West Indies. Iron-willed, short-tempered, and puritanical, Peter Stuyvesant had strict orders to clean the place up and make it pay. I shall govern you as a father his children, he told the stubborn and unruly citizens of New Amsterdam. And it was soon apparent he meant every word he said. Within weeks of his arrival, he had banned drinking on Sundays, outlawed knife fighting in public, and imposed stiff fines for missing church, speeding on Broadway, and fornicating with the Indians. It was the beginning of a long and stormy relationship between the director general and his colonists. But though they bitterly resented Stuyvesant's high-handed style of rule, New Amsterdam began to take hold. In an incredibly short space of time, he has slaves lay out the road up to Harlem, gets a wall built, has streets built, has the port fixed up, builds himself an extremely nice house, takes a large chunk of the slave population for himself, but in fact, makes this place into a functioning operation. The population increases, he establishes a, a base, an economic base, which is slaving. This is gonna be a slave entrepot, and they're gonna run slaves into here and then down to the Caribbean. By 1653, in less than five years, Stuyvesant had managed to transform the disorderly backwater into a bustling town with its own piers, canals, windmills, and schools. 300 row houses, a population of 3,000, and a 2,340-foot wall stretching all the way from the East River to the Hudson, built to keep out hostile Indians and the English so many things about New York that we think of as being unusual or distinctive in the 20th century really have their origins hundreds of years in the past. One thinks of congestion. Every American, every person in the world really knows about New York and its unusual vertical shape and the crowded streets. But again, this goes back to the 17th century really when the little Dutch village was crowded down in lower Manhattan and all the houses were flush up against each other or the heterogeneity of the population already in the 1640s. There were 18 different languages being spoken on the streets. Though it offended Stuyvesant's keen sense of order, to ease the chronic labor shortage, he reluctantly agreed to let in almost anyone willing to work. Census takers soon reported hearing a chorus of languages on the streets of New Amsterdam, including French, English, German, Spanish, Polish, and Portuguese. By 1654, the Dutch had become a minority in their own colony, and Stuyvesant himself feared that New Amsterdam would soon become too diverse to rule. If nothing is done to stop it, I fear this colony will soon become a babble of confusion. We have here Papists, Mennonites, and Lutherans among the Dutch. Also many Puritans or Independents, and many atheists who conceal themselves under the name of Christians. It would create a still greater confusion if the obstinate and immovable Jews came to settle here. But they soon did. In 1654, 23 Sephardic Jews sailed into the harbor seeking refuge from the Spanish Inquisition in Brazil. Stuyvesant immediately petitioned the board of directors of the Dutch West India Company to have them turned away, insisting, he said, 
that none of the Jewish nation be permitted to infest New Netherland. To his astonishment, the petition was overturned. Chiding him for his bigotry, the directors reminded Stuyvesant that he was running a business colony, not a religious establishment, and that for the sake of that business, no one should be turned away. The consciences of men ought to be free and unshackled, so long as they continue moderate, peaceable, inoffensive, and not hostile to government. Such have been the maxims of toleration by which this city has been governed. And the result has been that the oppressed and persecuted from every country have found among us an asylum from distress. Follow in the same steps and you shall be blessed. On September 12, 1654, the first Rosh Hashanah service in North America was held in private in New Amsterdam. It was the beginning of Congregation Shi'areth Israel, the oldest existing Jewish congregation in the New World. It was also the beginning of the separation of church and state in America. In the centuries to come, the city's greatest challenges and greatest strengths would always come from its astonishing diversity. New York did not remain Dutch long. Uh, there are several reasons. One is it really was not the financial success that the, the Dutch had hoped for. Secondly, and more important, the British were establishing themselves both down in Virginia and moving north in Massachusetts, especially around Boston, and coming south through Connecticut. And what the British noticed was there was this troublesome Dutch trading post in the middle of the British North American Empire. Stuyvesant's tragedy is that no sooner does he get this place all spiffed up and ready for action than the English sail in and take the place. On August 27th, 1664, four heavily armed English warships sailed into the harbor. Peter Stuyvesant climbed painfully to the top of Fort Amsterdam and made ready for battle. I had rather be carried to my grave than surrender, he said. But before a shot could be fired, he was handed a petition that had been signed by 93 of the town's leading merchants, including his own son. His citizens, only partly Dutch, looked at the guns of the British fleet, knew that they had a small little town which was made out of wood and closely built up, and that the British guns would have quickly reduced the city to a smoking ruin, and they implored Stuyvesant to turn over the city, which uh, he did, and with drums beating and flags flying, he marched out of this fort. Pete grumbled, but he had to surrender because the citizens of the town said, we won't lift a finger to fight the English. Why would we care who ran this colony or who taxed us? We'd be perfectly happy to have the English. You haven't done much of a job. In the years to come, Peter Stuyvesant, the man who first brought order to the city and thus assured its future, would retire to a sprawling fruit farm north of town on open land that would one day become Greenwich Village. The English governor who replaced him graciously offered free passage back to Holland to any Dutch citizens unwilling to accept English rule. No one took him up on it. Two days after the English takeover, on August 29, 1664, New Amsterdam was officially renamed New York in honor of the Duke of York, the brother of King Charles, to whom the colony had been promised as a birthday present. The day after that, everyone went back to work, as if nothing much had happened after all. 